We remember and celebrate the life of legendary, trailblazing, multi-instrumentalist, producer, and songwriter James Ntume, who passed away yesterday at age 76. The multi-Grammy winner and Philadelphia native will continue to inspire with his skills and sounds after working with the likes of Duke Ellington and Miles Davis and writing gems for Stephanie Mills and Roberta Flack and taking percussion to a whole other level of playing. And Tume participated in a black empowerment group as he spearheaded the celebration of Kwanzaa. He also pushed for social justice, Afrocentricity, and black nationalism. Joining me now to discuss the life and the activism of the monumental Mtume are his son, Falau Mtume, and two close friends, uh, Minister Abdul Akbar Muhammad, international representative of the Nation of Islam, and Brother Hassan, the founder of the Kwanzaa Fest. Gentlemen, my brothers, thank you so much for joining uh, me tonight. My condolences to all of you, as I know you have close family and, and kin uh, to Brother Mtume. Uh, Brother Hassan, I'm gonna start with you in just a few words who was James M. Tume? Uh, Bobby James M. Tume was black genius and excellence in personifying, embodying the absolute best of what our people are and what we can be. I've never met anyone in, like him in my life. Uh, he was so far ahead of his time. And uh, he was a teacher, he was a father, he was uh, so many uh, of the elements our people are lacking now, he embodied those. And for me, he was a mentor and a very, very dear friend. Wow, uh, Minister Muhammad, uh, James Ntume was uh, a musical genius of the absolute highest order. Uh, but I think what resonates with so many of us is that as committed as he was to music, he was equally passionate about social activism. He reminds me of a Dick Gregory type of figure. Would that be a fair assessment? I think so. Uh, first, thank you very much for having me on. And uh, Mtumi was my brother, my friend, traveling companion, and uh, a warm person. You don't meet people who help people just because they ask for help. And his years in the struggle when he was on the West Coast and then coming from a musical family. Geniuses came out of that family. And uh, we had the uh, blessing to travel to Sudan. Uh, we traveled to Libya. He came to Ghana with Bobby Humphreys and we sat and had an unbelievable talk uh, with President, late President Jerry Rollins. And Rollins was impressed by him, his sense of culture, but how you put the culture into the struggle and keep it right there. Don't leave culture hanging out on a limb, but uh, culture is a part of this great struggle. And he proved that by the music that God blessed him to produce. So we, he'll be missed. I uh, think about him. His son called me early that morning that he passed, and I took me a while to just get my head together. Uh, he had a favorite uh, shoe that he liked to wear a pair of shoes. They came from the Sudan. Mm. And whenever he would go to the Sudan with me, he would buy these particular shoes and you would find him wearing them wherever he traveled. Wow, such a such a beautiful moment, Akbar. I remember the last time, I think you, you the last time I was with uh, Brother Mtume was at the farm. I, I believe you were with us at the, that day and we were just sitting around vibing, listening to music. Yep. And uh, That's right. he was such a such, such a beautiful, such a beautiful spirit, such a generous, um, such a generous spirit. Um, it was just an honor to be around him. And he was so humble as we were listening uh, to the music. And, 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 and it's like, he's a legend. He's a giant. He could be taking over the room. He could be taking over the That's space. Right. And, and he didn't do that. Instead, he, he just sat down and, and vibed out, man. It, it, it's amazing to see. Uh, Falau, let me bring you in, man, because obviously... It's one thing for us to be fans, to be friends, but talk to me about who he was for you as a father. Thank you very much for this, um, for this opportunity and, and to be here with these two gentlemen who meant so much to my father and mean so much to us. Um, it's really, really profound to try and describe what kind of man and what kind of father he is and was to us. I mean, here's a man that was intellectually a giant, politically profound, 
creatively un unparalleled, but was probably one of the most kindest, gentlest, and compassionate people you can ever be around. I was very fortunate because right. uh, you don't, you know, that saying you don't get to choose your family. But not only did I have an archetype for what a man is, not only did I have access, he was mine at all times. But you know what? He was everyone's because um, we have, a, as we're going through this, yeah. we have not spent any time on any social media. I haven't looked at anything online. And the true telling part is all the friends that I grew up with that came through this house, and it was an open house, and they said that how he, how they saw that how he raised his children is how what they took on for themselves and how they chose to raise their families. And I think that that's the most telling thing that we say about him as a, as a father, as a father, as a father. Wow, wow. Look, we got so much to cover here. I want to take a, uh, a break and come back because I don't want to rush this. He is a legend and he deserves all of this conversation. So my brother Falal, brother uh, Hassan and Minister Akbar Muhammad, please stay with us. We're going to continue this conversation right after the break. Everybody stay right here on Black News Tonight. Black News Tonight. We now continue our conversation about the life and the impact of the tragic passing of James and Tume. The legendary musician, the songwriter, the record producer, and the activist passed away on Sunday at the age of 76. Joining me now are his son, Faulu Mtume, and I want to apologize for mispronouncing his name earlier, uh, and two longtime friends, Minister Abdul Akbar Muhammad, who's international representative of the Nation of Islam, and Brother Hassan, the founder of the Kwanzaa Fest. Gentlemen, welcome back to the show. Uh, Hassan, you and James and Tume shared many experiences, including a trip to Libya back in 2009. Uh, what was your first impression when you started spending time and connecting and traveling with the brother? Okay, well, let me answer that. And But first, I want to make something clear is that I didn't just meet him, Tume, randomly. This man to my right, who's like a father to me, Brother uh, Akbar Muhammad, he facilitated that. So I owe him a lifelong mm. debt of gratitude for having made that happen. Okay, so uh, I want to make that clear. He with him on a junket to uh, Libya, and I met uh, Baba M. Tume uh, in Washington, D.C. for about five minutes, and then we bonded there in Libya. And my first impression was that I was swimming in knowledge, wisdom, and pure intellect like I'd never encountered before. That was my first impression. Now, something that Brother Akbar may not know is that my background is in music. I played piano for 10 years and saxophone for about two and a half. So I connected musically with Baba M. Tume, and so much of what he taught me, he would use musical analogies. So, I mean, you know, I knew that I'd never met anyone like this only, and knew for sure that whatever it was that was churning inside this person was going to be something that would deeply affect the direction of my life. Wow. Minister, uh, Minister Akbar, one of the things that, first of all, you are one of the most well-traveled people I have ever met in my life. Uh, and part of what you and James and Tume connected on was this idea of internationalism, making uh, connections across the African diaspora in particular. How important was the diaspora in, in the international context to understanding James and Tume and to understanding the music? Very important. It's a good point. Uh, one day I had the honor to meet Harry Belafonte. Uh, he was visiting Minister Farrakhan suite in Washington, D.C. And uh, we began to talk about the world. And uh, Harry Belafonte told the minister, he said, the international arena is where it's at. And not that I understood all of it, but the international re region is important. And what is beautiful about Entumi, when we made these trips and I would get so many people that we could take on the trip, he'd reach out. And he wouldn't reach out just to his familiar friends, but he would reach out to new stars, uh, new people in the media, and give them an opportunity to travel. That was the kind of brother he wanted. He wanted to use his position to move around the world to help open the eyes of our young brothers. And, and he was really good at that. Some of the sisters that he took on, he invited them. Some of them were skeptical, you know, going to 
Libya, going to the Sudan, going to Ghana, but he would encourage them and was telling them that this is an eye opener for you. And uh, I bear witness the movement around the world and to be able to talk about different countries and their challenges that they have to keep their society alive. M. Toomey was right there. I just wanted this little caveat. Uh, we took Bobby Humphrey to Ghana, and uh, I hope that they bring up the picture of M. Toomey and President, late President Rawlins. But um, we went to this club in Ghana, and Bobby didn't have any backup. Now, mind you, I didn't know my brother's depth on that keyboard. So he pulls out the keyboard they had there, and he started playing it. I was standing there with my mouth open, and then Bobby came right in. I tried to reach him for the last couple of days, and if anybody who's watching the program tonight, tell her to please get in touch with Akbar. So I just wanted to, to say that. And uh, I think his son, we call him Fowl. I mean, that's when I met him, his son, father said, just call him Fowl Akbar. Um, mm -hmm. And I can mm -hmm. bear witness that his father was a warm, gentle soul, always yes. looking to help somebody, always yes. looking to encourage somebody. And when when uh, they do did uh, the picture that had Natalie, the club in it, um, who, whoever knows what I'm talking about, he would always bring um, artists on there and give them a chance to uh, sing, play at Natalie's as a part of that uh, show that was on by a wolf. Um, many of you yeah. may know it, but I would always be there. And I would say, I said, look how and to me reached out to artists who are out there who are good. Many people don't know and give them a shot on this show. No, it, it, it's, it's amazing. It speaks to his generosity and how serious he was. F F F F let me let me bring you in because I want to ask you a, a question about uh, your father and another piece of his life, which is which is Kwanzaa. He was very very serious about Kwanzaa. Uh, how first of all, y'all celebrated it growing up, uh, which you know, and at a moment where black folk hadn't fully taken to it yet, on mainstream widespread. But he was, I mean, he was one of the forerunners of this. How important was Kwanzaa to him and to y'all? Well, Kwanzaa was very important to us because what what it meant was this was the first time that we had something that we created for ourselves, uh, that we didn't ask anybody for, that we own. Uh, so you have to keep in mind that um, he and my mother were there since the very first one, uh, when they were members of us organization back in California. Uh, so in 1972, when I was born, and we were living here in New Jersey, uh, that's all we ever celebrated. We, you know, my grandparents had celebrated Christmas in our house. It was only Kwanzaa. So you got to have to try and be sensitive to, sensitive to this and imagine in the 70s having a name like Fa'ulu and your parents celebrate this thing called Kwanzaa. Uh, it wasn't very inviting. It wasn't very attractive for a lot of people. And they didn't understand it. So over the years, to see what it's become and how it's being recognized and how it's being accepted, how it's being celebrated, uh, was something that he's always felt very proud of. And that, if I could, I just want to speak a little bit to what uh, Brother Akbar was saying about his internationalism in regards to the music. One of the most important Please. things for him always from the beginning was the black consciousness in music as a thematic fiber, no matter what he was doing. It was always to elevate and always to intertwine that and have that present somehow, some way. Uh, as a percussionist, obviously, that's 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 pretty, uh, pretty in your face. It's, it's the drum, it's the rhythm, it's Africa even all the way over to Juicy Fruit, which might have been a little bit more provocative on the lyrical side, but that thing, that drum, that beat, that's Africa, that's live, that's, and that's what yeah. he always wanted to raise. And, and as Akbar was saying, he was very good, and he would never tell you. It was so many things that he'd done for so many people that it was only him and that person that knew, and that's the only way to do it, because if more than two people know, you did it for the wrong reason. And uh, as Akbar of saying, especially young writers, a willingness to do something. He was always there. I have so, look, he'd never asked anybody to call him Baba. 
they do that because that's what it is, mm. and that's what he that's what he always that's has been right. to them, always. Always, but his his the root wow. of everything with him is black people first and black consciousness and us not being afraid to put ourselves first, and that went for his music, that went for his po political stance, that went for his activism. Uh, all the years that he did open line radio, it was never about any money, and he he would he would as Akbar was saying he would be at those sets working on New York Undercover, recording all those stuff all those songs for Natalie's, getting out of the studio at five in the morning going to the radio station to go do that show. 18 years, would never miss a day if he could. Right. And that right. was just to make sure that wow. his position for our people and his information, because he was very, very talented that way. The man, he was, a, he was an incredible mix of intellect, instinct, and intent. An incredible blend. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's easy for me to say, because I was so close to him, it's my father, and it almost sounds like I'm bragging, but he was a very, very special man. He always told us, he said, uh, no. the special people and there's fortunate people. The trick is to know which one you are and act accordingly. And he acted accordingly <laughs> because he shared everything he had. He shared everything he had. He shared everything. I'm I, fortunate. I, I know I, that. <laughs> I know that. He man, is special. Man. Extremely special. Man, he, a, a special brother who whose impact almost can't be measured, you know, a, a beautiful spirit, a wonderful man. I think I think you all captured it perfectly. My brothers, thank you so much for spending some time with us here on Black News tonight. And again, I want to offer my deepest condolences uh, to you, uh, to all of you, but certainly for, as his son. Um, thank, thank you so much for, for giving the time so quickly after this tragic passing. And again, as he returns to the ancestors, he will never be forgotten by us. Everybody, if you want to get more information about the Kwanzaa Fest, make sure you log on to the KwanzaaFest.com website. That's KwanzaaFest.com.